And so this is a panel discussion and uh, it involves you as well. So it's a whole of room discussion, just trying to focus down on the challenges moving forward. We'll try and use your postcards, but just what we can do as a community, um, as a primary healthcare sector in Queensland moving forward for the next four years in terms of some sort of action that will get there. What are the facilitators? What are the barriers? These are the, these are the sort of topics that we're going to cover. And uh, so let me introduce the panel to you. And um, hopefully they won't get a word in edgeways because you'll be asking so many questions or making so many comments. Melissa Fox is on the panel. Melissa, I'll just come up as I introduce you if you don't mind, is General Manager of Health Consumers Queensland, which thankfully is now a funded organization in Queensland. Um, so this is a really good thing. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, we have Helen Meese, who's a consumer representative, very experienced consumer representative um, and advocate for consumer-centred care. Um, Tracy Johnson, the General Practice of the Year at the AgPAL Awards, uh, CEO of Inala Primary Care. Welcome, uh, Tracy Johnson. Uh, Emma Hossack, is CEO of Extensia, a vendor in the IT sector, but also chair of the Medical Software Industry Association very interested in the issue of privacy. Uh, Brenton Parkin, who's Executive Director of Community Information and Support Services, um, uh, an organization devoted to actually giving people the knowledge and information they need to navigate through the system and try and drive integration. Chris McCarthy, uh, CEO of Hear and Say, for, uh, which has, um, uh, uh, aspires to be, um, uh, uh, provide a service for children who are deaf uh, of, of uh, world-class excellence, and is also a board member of, um, of Checkup. And Anthony Brown, last but not least, Director of Medical Services, Torres and Cape Hospital and Health Service, Anthony, which is also a PHN, isn't it? Overlaps with a PHN. <laughs> so um, give us the dream, Melissa. Sure. Um, thanks for having me along today. I have to say that when I looked at the timeline, um, my heart sank a little bit, um, and I was I was pleased to see, you know, the recognition. Well, that it's almost within your funding frame, so you've got to get on with it and do it. I know. I know. Tell me about it. <laughs> um, but you know, it is a large ship that we're trying to turn. Um, but I was really excited at the thought of, um, you know, being in 2020 and looking back. And for me, um, my vision is that by 2020, we know if what we've been talking about for the last several years is making a difference. And um, particularly, I'm talking about um, the new direction of trying to create more consumer-centred care and doing that through widespread um, consumer engagement. The national standards have existed since um, you know the beginning of 2013, and they've seen an absolute explosion in the amount of activity in that area. We have health services coming to us asking how do we measure what we're doing and you know how do we use that to show that we need more resources in this area. So by 2020, I'd like to be um, you know standing up here saying that we've created a national database of consumer-created uh, measurements that look at the outcomes that um, we're all working towards through consumer engagement. And that would be a database that consumer organisations can put their activities into, but also all of you, health services right across um, primary so, and tertiary. So is there a shred of evidence at the moment that, that consumer engagement is anything other than activity for CEOs to meet their KPIs? <laughs> Well, unfortunately, it's not one of their KPIs. I mean, meeting the national standards is, but that's one of the problems is there's actually, you know, in service agreements, no real drivers. So it's what gets you through accreditation at the moment unless you have that commitment and that, you know, understanding the value of it and doing it because it's the right thing to do. So give us a flavour. I mean, we all talk about putting the consumer at the centre of care. It's usually the same organisations that say we value our workers and uh, you, you know, and as you keep on hearing that, your level of cynicism keeps on growing about those organisations. Um, give me a flavour of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Sure, sure. Um, and I think the issue for us is that there is good, bad, and ugly. Um, you know, there are organisations that seem to be doing it, um, you know, in patches because they have to, you know, for um, tick a box. And then there's others where you know there is a true commitment to partnership and it's been played out over years of developing meaningful relationships between consumers and consumer organisations. Yeah, but what does that translate leaders. into, really? Well, it translates into the, you know, it's got to translate into the change in how services are delivered. Well, that's so what I'm really I'm asking. It yeah. doesn't really matter what your engagement is. 
if, it, if you get the end product. What does the end product look like when it's right? Yeah, it looks like service delivery that meets consumers' needs. So, you know, often that will include services closer to home, <coughs> um, you know, with a known caregiver so we're not repeating our story over and over again. Um, and one that respects our decisions, gives us information to make informed decisions that might not always be the ones that our health professionals have recommended but that are right for us. So, Helen, give us a sense of the gap that's got to be filled by 2020 for this to be real. Well, I was listening to Melissa and thinking that my dream is some of those things. So what I did was I took my situation from last year when I'd had a fall and broken my leg and I put it four or five years in the future and I said, look, this time it just went so much better. It was really good because I was already involved in a gym that my GP had got me involved in and it was actually funded by my local PHN and HHS. And, and that's where, in fact, you broke your leg. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I was roller skating. They had suggested I give roller skating up, but I was so excited about still being able to roller skate on my 64th birthday that I had persisted. And what I found wonderful was I arrived at the ER, bit dopey, I was <clears throat> using the green whistle and it really worked, and so I just waved my Medicare card. This was before you broke your leg. This is after. <laughs> <laughs> I waved my Medicare card at whoever first met me. And after that, I didn't have to worry because they pulled up all my records. And in doing that, they discovered all my health issues, which are complex because I have chronic health problems. And at the same time that they pulled it up, a notification had gone to my GP. So she actually dropped in a little bit later on her way home to say what on earth is going on and what have you done this time? And I told you about the roller skating. And from there, I went home the next day with services already in place. Transport, because it was my right leg again and I couldn't drive and I live on my own. But no, they had organised transport, they had organised physio through the gym that I'd already started attending. They all knew what my capabilities were before I broke my leg and they worked really hard to get me back to that. Which is how come when I went to the Olympics in Tokyo, I actually managed to do quite a bit of walking, which was just as well. Thanks. Okay. That gives the flavour. Um, Chris, do you believe you're providing child centre care at the moment? I think the short answer is, of course, yes. But in actual fact, I think the longer answer is we're actually providing care to support the family. I think, uh, you know, in actual fact, uh, we don't want to we don't want to fix broken adults. We actually want to build strong and resilient children. And I think for me, uh, you know, the exciting vision of 2020 is having spent a whole heap of time pulling apart health, education, and disability, and creating a communities portfolio that focuses on early childhood and actually builds kids who are actually going to grow into, you know, community members who support each other and advocate for each other and, um, and, and that will help address some of the, you know, some of the issues we've been talking about today. So, so yes, I think I'd like to think we are doing a very child-centred so, so give me a sense of the gap between now and then to get where you think you should be. Um, I, think, uh, I think we should remove the word no, you know, to start with, um, because uh, at the, you know, and lots of the conversations that I've heard today, have, or, you know, over the last sort of 24 hours, have all been around funding. You know, and at the end of the day, that's you know, my bank doesn't yet take my love tokens, as much as I turn up there and ask them to pay my mortgage for the love that I share, um, <laughs> they won't accept that. So there does need to be a way in which we can focus on supporting communities through funds. You know, at the end of the day, that does money does make the world go round. So let's be honest about it. And all the, all the outcomes in the world are fantastic as long as they're linked to something that enables us to pay the bills and put food on tables. So it really, is it about money? Well, I, I think, uh, no, it's about community health. It's about, sorry, I'll rephrase it. It's about community outcomes. And I think community outcomes uh, include health, well-being, you know, and finance is part of that. Um, and I think, you know, people want to be able to provide for their children and they want to be able to live a life that allows them to roller skate when they're 64 or you know, do whatever it is that happens to be their bent. And at the moment, I think we are, um, we're probably focusing on fixing some of the problems as opposed to avoiding some of them. You can cut a ribbon on uh, a preventative uh, program, but you can't actually cut a ribbon on a, 
on a, uh, sorry, you can't cut a ribbon on a preventative program, but you can cut a ribbon on an outcome sort of thing. So, so where does the money go? What's your highest priority? Um, oh, look, I, I, you know, for me personally, I actually think there's a lot around sort of the maternal health and the maternal education piece. I think, you know, consistently uh, lots of research demonstrates that outcomes for a community are built on um, maternal education. Uh, I think uh, child health and, you know, some of that early intervention and, and inclusive design that looks at... So, uh, so I'm not aware of a shred of evidence that teaching mothers about anything changes their behaviour? Uh, no, but having mothers who are educated does... So, you, so you're talking about something different. You're talking about education in the education system. Uh, I'm talking about educating people who are going to become parents. Can so I butt in there? So, yeah, sure. Because I don't think you need to educate parents, and I'll include dads as well as mums. Yep. I think you need to educate doctors. Because I actually attended the Here and, I, Here and Say Centre many years ago as a mum of a 12-month-old with profound hearing loss. And um, I had spent the six months prior saying to a GP, I think my baby's deaf. And the GP saying, oh, I wonder how you'd tell. I don't think you can do anything yet. So, actually, I don't think parents need to be educated nearly as much as the professionals they consult. And, and maybe it's empowered. Maybe that's probably the right word. Yep. Yeah. Because, you know, that story is not a story that I think would um, be, be unfamiliar to many people, not just in our space, but, you know... And not just with hearing impairment. That's exactly right, yeah. Uh, by the way, um, one person who's missing from this who co really couldn't be here is Sandy Gillis, who's the Acting Chief Operating Officer of uh, Quake. And, um, and I would encourage those people here from community-controlled organisations to pipe up and contribute to the discussion, given that we don't have somebody on the panel to represent community, the community-controlled sector. And by the way, just come up at any time to those microphones in real time and I'll bring you into the conversation rather than waiting until some time at the end, because we might not get there so I'd much rather you said something when you've got something to say it in real time so just come up and, and, and say it. Um, Emma just give us a sense so, so you know Helen's talks about wanting to get to the point where um, you know everything's there we've presumably got to the point where opt out works so that we have more people in than not and you've got the odd general practitioner who's actually uploading a record. That would be nice. Um, so we, we lost fear of privacy. So we're, we're sharing, we're in Kumbaya land and no problem. Are you asking me if that's possible? Yes. Okay. Um, I don't think we'll be in Kumbaya land in 2020. I think that trust has to be earned. And I think that the government is going to have, I mean, they're, they're looking at this a little bit like an IT project. And I think that... Uh, we've just seen a couple of weeks ago with the census, those kind of attitudes that we're getting, look, trust us, it'll work, and within hours it wasn't working. I think they impact quite heavily on the engagement with community and their willingness to trust the government with their most sensitive information. So I think that it's going to be um, an exercise in uh, education, a bit like the kind of quit smoking type of campaign. I think that that would be fantastic if we're going to get there by 2020. Something which will be engaging, educating, give people a sense of trust and, and an understanding of why, because everyone in this room probably understands the benefit of sharing essential information with people who are looking after them. Um, but out in the community, when you say my health record or shared health information systems, that kind of thing, people's eyes gla glaze over. There's not the education there which we need to result in trust. So I think, and I, I really do believe that trust is the platform for this. I think, you know, we talk about digital economy. Um, the digital economy is, health is part of that. And that depends on trust. No one would use a bank if they felt less than, uh, you know, at least 50 plus percent sure that their funds would be looked after. But you well, can have all the social marketing campaigns in the world. Yeah. One stuff up will get you, will ruin the trust. Well, well, look, one stuff up if handled badly in a non-transparent way. So if there's a stuff up and there's a cover up and there's not a full frank disclosure of what went wrong and what's being done to fix it, um, yes, it will, it will stuff things up, Norman. But in privacy, you see with um, decisions that come down from the Privacy Commissioner in Australia, 
always there's a lot more sympathy, both from the uh, people who have been betrayed by a particular organisation and with the Privacy Commissioner, when it's handled with openness and honesty. We stuffed up, this is what we did or we didn't do, this is what we're doing in future and we're deeply sorry. Um, I think most people are, are quite reasonable about that because health is never going to be perfect and every organisation is going to suffer a breach of privacy in one form or another. That's what we were told last week by the Privacy Commissioner in the Ashley Madison case. He said, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And I think we all have to get real. The convenience of digital health and digital life is also a compromise and it's a bit of a risk and you weigh that up. You share what you're happy to possibly be slipped out, but you don't share something that you know will have a devastating effect on your health. But the records functionality is moving forward at a glacial pace. And that, I mean, to be fair to GPs, that's one of the reasons for scepticism. That, you know, why would you bother when there's, there's such limited functionality? And the, the plan for increased functionality is not, you know, it's very interesting to think what might be there in 2020, but it may not be very much. No, and, and you've actually nailed it with that. Um, I Was think that your question, Lisa? Sorry. Sorry. I, uh, I channeled you, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, look, I think you've nailed that. That question's really key. And I was speaking to the new CEO of uh, the Australian Digital Health Agency uh, yesterday, and he agrees that... Who the, is that, by the way? That is a guy called Tim Kelsey, newly appointed. From, uh, from Britain. From Britain. Um, and but Telstra he's, Health. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's the one. Um, so whatever you think Taking of him, over the world. whatever you think of him, um, he does acknowledge that the My Health record is only one small part of the digital health economy. Um, all of the other rich uh, digital health programs, like you know, we've got here this community uh, record, uh, sorry, community um, uh, directory, which allows people to find the right person, right time, all of that. There are hundreds of those, and they all are basically what we're talking about when we talk about digital health. The national record is a national database with a limited set of data fields which are very useful, but they're not the whole game. It's static data. It's not dynamic. It's not for coordination of healthcare, but it's really useful. It's great to have it, but don't think that that's going to fix everything. It's the rich ecosystem, hundreds of different systems, which will ultimately operate with that. So I could go to Quantium or one of the other big data companies mm and find far more about the healthcare system in an integrated way and personal behaviour than anything we've got in the health system. What's to stop us using retail data? Nothing. So why aren't, why aren't we using retail data? I mean, using retail data, I can pinpoint GPs who are over-prescribing um, um, antibiotics or over uh, under-prescribing diabetes medications relative to the needs of their population without using PenCat or anything like that. Yeah. We're not using that data. I mean, truly that's yeah. what you're talking about. Oh, I, I am. And, and I think that that in four years' time would be absolutely fantastic, not just um, the healthcare people, providers using that data, but the individual themselves. If you start seeing your pattern, gosh, I've been to the bottle shop quite a lot this week or um, things like that. It, it's a bit of a wake-up call. No, truly. And so it's a two-way street. But I wasn't really looking at that website. No, it wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, how come I've got all those liquor points? I couldn't be. Um, but, but the point being, I think that in four years' time, if we, my dream would be for not just the providers, but all of the patients, all of the, all of us, um, to have control over our data. So if we actually want to make that available to organisations like Quantium, because um, some of it does depend on us doing that, not ding into Woolworths loyalty cards. If we wanted to make our data available to which organisations we want and trade it. So if Quantium is making a fortune from mining my data, they should give some back to me. And if I want Red Cross to have my data for free because they're fantastic, absolutely. That's what I'd like to see, an exchange of data which would also allow you to map your health journey. Redson? I'm going to name it. And I know when I name it, people kind of get really quiet. Is this quiet. your favourite website you're about to name? Or no, no. no, no. Right. What we're talking about and what's going to stop us doing this is called the politics of data. And we, around the room, have to sit here and think about what that really means for all of us. And I'm, I, you know, everyone's going to kind of get quiet and I'll walk out alone and at the end of the, the panel. But we, we've started trying to develop shared data. So we run a website, but it's not actually the website that matters. It's that we're sharing information about services. You know how hard that is? 
Do you know how hard it is and the excuses I've heard? I, we could list them and they are some of them, if you listen to the excuses we make about working together, 2020 doesn't look much different today. However, I see 2020 being where we've decided that health does matter, that we're not going to make a, a differentiation between health and community services. We're going to say wellness is our goal. So what we're going to do is we're going to say if that's our goal, we're going to stop playing the politics of data, which means some of you may not speak to me in the room, uh, but we're going to stop it and we're going to say, no, we're going to start working together because all we've done is tried to collect who does what, when, where and why. Or at least that's what you guys think we do. Right? We also have a diary, but with some other clients who are really adventurous with data, really adventurous, they're now starting to share which um, of their clients they can check in, like a sign-in register, and actually see where clients are travelling. But the problem with that system is that it has a really, um, a really big impact because it's a mirror. Suddenly I can see things about my service delivery that I might not want to see. I might not actually be consumer focused. And I can tell you, I've, we've got Service Linker being the product, but I've had people come and get involved and then they want to pull out quickly because they're like, oh no, that's not what we tell government. So Tracy, what's the incentive for organisations to actively and eagerly want to know that information rather than shut the door on it? I think at the moment, if you look across the healthcare sector, everyone is fairly stressed. We've had people stand up today quite justifiably saying, you know, I'm, I'm change fatigued, I'm worried about my patients, I'm worried about my own health. You know, there's a lot of worry factor built in across the healthcare system. As a result of that, we pay a premium for services because people providing those services need to be insured and the people delivering those services think, well, if I'm going to go through all this stress, I'm going to get paid for it, thank you very much. If we can actually create a system where there's more proactive care, there's more linkage that bridges the reasons people get unwell to the services they need to stay well or improve their health, so we bridge the health and social care divide, all of a sudden that whole inbuilt stress and when we get stressed we tend to become more power hungry, more territorial, big on fiefdoms, big on revenge, all of those you know nasty unhealthy behaviours that we as human beings have. If we can actually reduce that by making decision-making aids available, by making data on where is my patient, where are they at, what information feeds can I get on their behaviours, their biomarkers, other care providers and what they've done, etc. So I'm not running around like a mad goose every time something happens with this patient, but it is much more planned and organised and proactive and solves the real issue rather than me feeling like I'm constantly a band-aid provider then all of a sudden we might have some more sensible conversations and we'll save money. So we'll be able to have sensible conversations about with this money that we otherwise would have spent, can we invest it in the early childhood stuff? Can we invest it in some stuff that it addresses the wish list that people might have about so, personalised care? So given that today there's a lot about technology today and you do need some technology assistance to do this. Yeah. So we know that you can change clinician behaviour by, well, you can change it by changing consumer behaviour, but you can also change it by benchmarking and feeding back performance in a private way. So my answer to, my question to you, Brenton, is why are you just exposing these organisations rather than creating a benchmark and private feedback, which would then get them on a track to improvement? Why don't you create a safe environment for that mirror? Certainly, um, it's some of the work we're doing at the moment. So we, we, we haven't gone down this concept where people can comment directly and publicly in the TripAdvisor space because we're people and we're far more complicated than is this a nice room? Yes, no, is it comfortable, is it cheap? So people are far more complicated and, and I think one of the things that is most important about this information access is that if we can make information open and accessible and people make choices, their choices may be very different than the ones we thought they'd choose. So, um, we, 10 years ago I was benchmarked. Every six months I got a letter in the mail from Medicare and from the PBS who told me what my prescribing and my uh, MB, MBS habits were. Now, why did that fail? Why did that go away? It was a very good tool. It was a very good tool. And so there must have been a, a systems error in there 
that meant that it all, it all closed down. So, so did you trust the data, first of all? Well, the data was as good as we could get back then from MBS and PBS. So you, you didn't care, is really what you're telling oh, me? Oh, no, I cared because we, we benchmarked amongst our doctors. It was quite a powerful tool. Um, if so you it succeeded for you? It succeeded for me, yes. I changed my behaviour because of that. And how did you know others didn't? Uh, well, because of the cohort that I shared the information with. We all changed our behaviour. But then it stopped. Do you still got one, do you? Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so, so aren't we doing this already? <laughs> You're about to that, get that's the visit, help. Wendy. <laughs> that ghastly person's going to come in and do that audit. <laughs> so it seems we're going back to the future, that's all. I just wonder if it, the conversation is doing a circular motion. Just uh, and what worries me is that we've been doing things in health that we do differently in community services and we haven't thought about the health and community services industry. And with open data and new data sources, that's coming together far quicker so, Tracy, than we think. Tracy, do we have the measures? So in other words, if you're going to say, you know, consume, you know, first of all, do we have measures that we can reliably say, and I'll come to Melissa in a minute, this, these are simple measures of consumer-centred care not consumer engagement, forget about that. I certainly All we think care about we have a plethora of measures. Um, so if we look at the Improvement Foundation's work, you know, they've got 150 quality indicators and the NPS gives me quality indicators and yes, we still get so some So Michael stuff Marmot yesterday at the Borough Lecture launch said for social determinants of health, for a nation, there are three. Absolutely. That's all you need, yep. three, not 150. Yeah. So what are the three for consumer-centred care? <coughs> This consumer's dying. Because it's not going to work for 150. <coughs> no. Forget it. Um, and I think that we've, for too long, tried to look for a measure to give every child a prize or a measure to become so discreet and, and argumentative about what's go good, bad or indifferent that we've got this you know, huge number of measures. I think if we can mm. agree on five, which is probably all our brains can, can focus ourselves on anyway, um, we will then be able to have more useful change more useful reflection on personal behavior because a lot of this does come back to personal behavior um, and the systems that we need both relationally and technology wise and training wise to be able to deliver more effective care so, so surely the best measure we have is equity and there's been a comment made i don't know who famous person said we'd actually have to spend anything more on health we don't i'm a big believer to, to, that to we don't need any more resources outcomes, we've just got to spread we do so an equity not equality yeah. so equity yeah. is the issue and in the Taurus... So I'm not sure I know what you mean. So equity is... So equality is about having the same number of females, male toilets. Equity is about making sure that we don't get lots of women all in the same toilet crowded together. So we've got more toilets for f females than males. That's equity. I'd vote for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Okay. <laughs> Okay, so we've got consumer-centred lavatories, but yeah, why else? Right. We, I'm looking for something a little bit, well, anyway, clearly gets Tracy going, so I'll, why would I? So in, in, in the Taurus, for instance, where all this, you could stop doing what you're doing in Brisbane now and concentrate the resource up there and you'd improve your health outcomes if you had the resource put in the right place. So the, the, the conversation is about resource allocation for me and, and uh, but equity it, of access. But from, yeah. what I, but from what I know, you would not actually put it into the healthcare system in the Taurus. <laughs> they were going to, you're supporting more primary school teachers and better educational outcomes. And giving us a physiotherapist. But we do need some, some, we've only got one physiotherapist for the lot, so we need another couple of physiotherapists. And yeah. I'll come back to you, Melissa, on measures in a minute. Norman, thank you. Uh, Anthony Oston from Montrose. I, I just want to explain what Montrose is. Uh, Montrose is a uh, Montrose Therapy and Respite Services is a uh, a Brisbane uh, a Brisbane uh, uh, head office organisation that provides uh, principally uh, paediatric uh, allied health services to children and young young adults with significant disabilities, and we also provide uh, a range of services across the state as the NDIS grows as well. Uh, I wanted just to bring together, I suppose, a couple of threads of conversation that that uh, I saw from this morning and, and the panel just reflected on just now as well. So I heard this morning that well, there is some $45 billion worth of waste uh, in the health system. 
just heard the panel say that we don't need to spend anything more on health. Uh, if I think about postcards from the future in 2020, we know that uh, the, federal gov the federal government budget is under pressure. Perhaps it's unrealistic to expect the health budget to increase one nominal dollar from what it is today uh, if there are any external shocks or events. So I'm interested in the panel's views. If that is the scenario and what we need to achieve, what are the things that we need to start doing uh, over the next 12 months to, to hit an outcome like that in 2020? I'm happy to go first. Um, so in primary care, one of the biggest things that we need to recognise is that whilst funding doesn't matter, in another sense it does matter, it's about freeing up the funding so that we can take the care that needs to be delivered and have it delivered by the right sorts of people. At the moment we are way too GP-centric. In hospitals we're still way too specialist-centric um, and frankly we're way too hospital-centric in too many you know, instances. So if we actually started asking ourselves the question, what is the problem? What is the alignment of resources we need to that to do that? And then who's going to do this and do it more regularly rather than saying, well, this is my job or I've always done this sort of care. Or um, So just as Montrose, you know, you used to deliver certain sorts of care to your sorts of patients and now you've had to ask yourself the question, we've now got a national uniform price for disability services. What sorts of care are we going to deliver? Who's going to deliver it? And it's fundamentally changed your models. Um, we need to be having more of those conversations so the allocation of care and the delivery of care by the right sorts of people to the right sorts of people. And some of those people may in fact be patients caring for each other, families caring for each other better, communities caring okay, for each other okay, better. Okay, so your vote is for cashing out and freedom to spend and presumably against a set of measures so that you're Absolutely. accountable. Absolutely. Emma? Yeah, I think um, the metrics are hugely important and I think at the moment they're orientated towards uh, the wrong things such as the system you mentioned before, the My Health Record. The metrics for success for that are numbers of registrations. Now, um, that doesn't mean success. Uh, that doesn't mean anyone's done anything useful, saved lives, that consumers have found it helpful. It's just a number of registrations, okay? So that's a crummy metrics. Um, I think that giving hospitals funding on the bas basis of you know, how many patients um, they get in beds is awful. I mean, what are they going to do? They're going to want to get patients in bed. Um, the funding should go to stopping people needing to go to hospitals so that instead of funding the states and then the primary health networks being funded by the Commonwealth, break that down, turn it around, let everyone see that the health does start uh, in the communities. It's not something that is between GPs and hospitals. And if you get rid of that, you get rid of that metrics, which I think is misplaced. So I think absolutely, from an industry perspective, we see, I suppose, up front the kind of information that's available from systems. We see how it could be used. It's not used and it's available. It's heartbreaking. So there is definitely so no So change the incentives. I'm sorry? Change the incentives. Change the incentives. The driver, absolutely, yep. The other one that I'm, I'm going to keep banging on about is shared data. In Queensland, today, there was a million dollars of duplicated data created just by community organisations that we can measure. A million dollars today in collecting the same data by the same or by people to do this linking together. And a million dollars yesterday and seven million dollars last week so there are efficiencies in shared data, there are shared data models. So what are the incentives, let's take an economic approach, what are the incentives to stop that shared data? Because telling the people not to do it, I mean, um, in Broadmeadows in Melbourne, they had like 21 different organisations. It took them three years to have one common assessment tool. I mean, that's another example of waste. So, and there was no, there was no incentive to do that. That was why, what incentives would you put in place so that people are encouraged to share data. What's in it for me? So there's probably two pieces. When we're talking about working together as a sector, health and communities, by being able to reduce the time, you've got to keep submitting the same information. We've talked about submit it once, use it many times. So as organisations, there's a piece of work that we need to be doing and it needs to be industry led. It can't be government-led. We've seen it many, many times. But you're not times. telling me what the incentives are for me to change. That's change management. I've got to convince people. People who collect the data are going to be pissed off and think they're out of jobs. Uh, you, know, I, you know, in theory, I can see the benefit, but I don't see the ben I don't. I don't see what's in it for me. As organisations and consumer-centred 
service delivery when consumers can choose, once you start being able to provide better services, because you can share and find better choices for that client, it will become a, a, a real incentive, a financial dollar incentive, because if you don't meet your client's needs, they can choose where they go. I'd actually say what we need is more population-based funding. Um, so if in a region, and that's where different regions will be able to also have differential funding. So in Antony's region up in the north, you know, his people are dying an average of 13 years younger than the rest of the Australian population out at Inala, where I come from. Again, really disadvantaged population. My patients are dying earlier. They're suffering more than twice as many years in, in fairly morbid conditions. So how do you get Ascot average. and Hamilton to give up their, their money? Look, Ascot and Hamilton can keep paying for themselves because they might be able to provide, you know, their own cash fee-for-service type model. But in terms of the money that we as taxpayers, and we're all collectively accountable to each other, we forget that. We are all collectively accountable to each other because we all contribute, in this room I'm suspecting, significant amounts of money in tax to fund private health insurance, state government service delivery, social you know, delivery, etc. If we actually started saying, hang on, what, how many people live in this catchment? How many of them are aged? How many of them are young? How many of them are disabled? You know, and you actually came up with modelling around what did that population need and then you started commissioning services that that's, that region could collectively say, well, you know, let's do it this way and this way and this way. So that's where the flexibility comes in. But the ultimate cap is about, you know, that population. And then by being more collaborative and cooperative, with the appropriate funding for that population, um, you will get better outcomes. You might get the West Australian problem that we've got now, where West Australians saying, you know, we provide all this GST money, but we don't get enough of it back. So that might be the Hamilton thing you've alluded to, but ultimately... But you, you're wanting integration with social care. So what are you going to say to the people who say, look, in your population south of the river, um, you're much better spending your money on adult literacy so that young parents will read to their children. That's the thing you've got to spend money on and forget you know, forget GP-led services. Absolutely. So if you look at places like So you're prepared to take money away from your GPs? I am. In Canterbury, they've done that. Instead of giving money to the hospital system for patients admitting with respiratory illness, they went into the community and put insulation into people's homes. And in two years, they got the money paid back and then some. So, you know, these are the patient-centred, community-activated type solutions that if we stop thinking healthcare, social care, GPs, nurses, doctors, whatever, and just saying, what's the problem? How are we going to resolve it? we actually might get some more creativity. Anthony? I was just going to comment that the MBS has uh, many perverse incentives, so I, I think that needs to be completely rejigged. Yep. Well, so we're going through that process now. Yeah, now but whether, whether we, we've already tried that before. The ophthalmologists and the IVF people put up the argument <laughs> last time we did it. So I think we, that's going to be a big political nut to crack, even if they come up with the right algorithm. But I think as a... As a nation, we have to have that, com that um, discussion. So we're talking about what needs to happen in the next 12 months to land four years. It's a good question. You know, to land at the right place four years from now. Chris, what's your recipe? What's going to happen in the next 12 months? Because we're not going to get there unless something happens in the next 12 yeah, months. I think, I think there's got to be a lot of courage. You know, individual courage is really the start point. And I think that you know, rests with many of the people in the room. And you know, to Tracy's point, some, somebody, and I'm, you know, somebody is is yourself, needs to make decisions within organisations to influence other groups. And I think that, uh, you know, there's lots of community advocates and consumer advocates here, um, and they do vote with their feet, you know. So to Brenton's point before, I actually think it's about taking a courageous decision at all levels of, of the sector, whether you be a consumer or an influencer of funding or an influencer of policy or, a, you know, in management. So. But, you, but you've got different systems now. So you've got NDIS, which in theory is consumer-led, consumer purchasing, and that's what Brenton's saying, that you'll get competition, and if you've got transparency, that will drive change. But you don't have it in healthcare, really. Look, and I think NDIS, you know, NDIS is a, there's a whole conversation within itself. I think NDIS... But if we're going to talk about bringing social care together with healthcare, you've got to talk about NDIS with, alongside it, have you not, in the next four You're years? You're right, and, I, and I, I even think in the, in the titling process of NDIS, I mean, why, why actually label it a disability service? Why not all call it Medicare Gold or All Australians or something like that? I think you've already put, uh, you know, a, a frame of reference around, uh, you know, a funding model, and it, it, at the end of the day, it does come back to a funding model, and I think that there's... Um, there are some opportunities there which are whole of community solutions 
which don't just look at healthcare in isolation, they look at you know, healthcare, education, disability. I'm concerned that we get our first question from a six month old baby, so let's go. <laughs> Hi, um, my name's Natasha, this is Rihanna, thanks for having us today. Um, I'm a She's consumer. been remarkably well behaved. <laughs> Um, I'm a consumer rep and I sit on a couple of different boards on um, state, metro north and local levels. And look, I, I really do appreciate the discussions <laughs> that are going on, but I want to bring it back to person-centred care. And I, I appreciate that there's money involved and there's bureaucracy involved. But to bring it back to consumers, and I appreciate everyone in the room is also a consumer, but when you have your work hats on, you probably have your work hats on a little bit more than a consumer hat and that emotional hat. So um, going back to where we started with Melissa, um, you know, I, I sit on those boards and, and I, I definitely have my, my voice heard how that then rolls out throughout all the standards and how that's going to affect change, I don't know. But person-centred care is about that individual choice and that's evolving. It changes for me when my daughter has an egg allergy. I have to make different choices. I have to utilise services. Um, you know, we've, we've got other people, you know, down this way. The, the person-centred approach there is going to be different as well. Um, I, I feel as though I'm hearing that it's still like big box. It's about choice. It's about having that individual choice. It's about whoever our health professional is offering us that choice. I don't know if there's anything other than an EpiPen for, for allergies, but I wasn't, there was no discussion. It was, here's a prescription for an EpiPen. So is it about consumers being educated that, to know that they have choice and is it about the so health professional. And that's a, it's a very, choice. that's a really good question. So, Helen, is it about knowing the questions to ask and having the confidence, or is it having the resources, which is where partly Brenton's coming from, although he would acknowledge that it's about asking the questions? That's a really important question. It is. And I mean, I keep thinking to myself, Monica talked about the old system being competition and the newer system moving to a more collaborative model. And to be honest, as a parent and as a consumer with health issues, I get really tired of being my own case manager, my own expert, my own researcher. There are times when I really would like to rely on my health professionals, and I can't. I can't see my kidney specialist and rely on her to get all of the information back to my GP. And God help me if I'm in Sydney and I get sick because none of that information is available. And that's really basic. When I have a child with a disability, I have to transfer all of the information between any service providers and the school. And yet their education is critical. If they want to come off disability support, they have to be educated. And that's vital. But where in all of this discussion is the education system? So... Emma, are we talking about, given the glacial pace from our health record, whatever the reason is, are we talking about entrepreneurially coming up with other IT solutions that may not be as secure, but are easy to use for people who actually, you know, if the world found out that my kid has got, uh, you know, ambilopia or something, I would actually don't mind them knowing that, you know. So yeah. should, we be, should we be encouraging alternate products which allow much greater ease of case management. Absolutely, case and, and they're out there. So patients like me um, and uh, hundreds of other really specific websites are patient-driven. Um, they are people who have got fed up with relying on their doctor who gave them information they didn't like or didn't trust and found that was incorrect. And they're actually talking to one another um, now about, okay, I've got this, has anyone heard about you know, XYZ? Doctors are in, engaging with that as well. So those sites are available. Uh, but I think that the, the issue that we've just heard here is, I mean, information is obviously power, and without that, a mother can't make her make her decision. Now, the problem we've got is all of those information sources at the moment are in discrete uh, software systems and those software systems are and all fabulous. Not, and they're not quality controlled. And, and, and they're not... Quality controlled. They're not quality you controlled. You go in for immunisation and you get absolute crap. A and if you want to move, for example, you didn't like the advice your GP gave you, you've got this terrible kind of moral feeling, hold on, that's my GP, I feel awful if I ask him for my record back because I want to see someone else. So you've got, you're really disempowered. And so 
My dream for the 2020 is for people to have access to all of their health information in all those different silos, but in the way that you have access to your banking really quickly. It's, it's kind of atomised so that you don't have to see everything in one fell swoop. You just want to see how much have I got to do this transaction now? Yes, no. Can I go for, forward and invest or yes, no? That kind of thing. So it's, it needs to be as good as that. And the thing from industry is that the tools are there now. They really, they exist now and there's going to be every day, there'll be a new app, there'll be a new software system being invented as I speak and they'll all be useful, um, but so, they're not going to solve so the if problem. It, if the Health Improvement Foundation and Penn are already extracting data, is there money in it for them to actually extract data for consumers with the permission of the practice? They're extracting data in um, aggregated forms, like they call it um, herd health, uh, is what I've heard it described as. So yeah, but, the, but, but it's based on individual general practitioner data, and it's only the turn of a key that would allow you a, an individual patient to come to, through. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. But um, it, it's a little bit, for those particular systems, a little bit more complicated. And Granite, too, from the University of Melbourne, does a whole lot of extraction as well. Um, you've got to, if you get the trust, you can probably get the consent relatively easily. I've been in this um, industry now 10 years and I thought that it was going to be a privacy minefield. I got involved because of that. I thought it would be fascinating. But in 10 years of dealing with shared information, health records, I've been asked three times really specifically, um, oh, we don't want to be involved in this because we don't trust the privacy implications. That's three times in, in 10 years. Um, and, you so know, it's not so as big an issue as you thought? No, it was, it's it? not. It's not. Brenton? Um, so shared data, what it means 2020 is that we're going to have 100 or 200 new applications that can help you find health and community services information. That's the kind of space we're trying to play in where we're, it, it's actually this piece of infrastructure which everyone keeps skirting around. If you don't know who, what providers, where they are, what they do, when they're in town, how you access them, simply it seems simple, but there is no central place where that's maintained. It's maintained across many places. Until we create that, which we're working actively on, it's very, very hard for consumers to actually make choice. The system's very difficult to navigate. So again, shared data, and, and there's many ways, and I, I truly believe 2020 looks like 100 different applications using that same vast data set. That's what's going to create the change. But 200 applications sounds incredibly complicated and confusing for a consumer. No, no, because if you've got a specific need, you can download the app or you can look online, but it's still the same data set as if you look at it in a different way. So the branding line. might be different, but the data set sits behind it. Isn't exactly it? right, and that's the missing piece. Yeah. And we'll come back to what we need to do to do that. Yes. Yeah, right. Cheers. Um, I think the um, 2020 is a good um, scope or, I suppose, a measure, but I think... Um, a little bit quicker than 2020, things are going to change dramatically with the uh, current funding schemes for uh, PHNs the like, as well as NDIS coming into the sector and obviously changing the footprint uh, for those organisations who are providing a service for consumers. So that and again will cause a, a slight dysfunct, I suppose, in, in the community of who's going to provide a service, who's funded to do it and how they're going to do that. So I think what would be nice is that there's heaps of data on people and consumers in the community. And I think organisations themselves, um, as an incentive, need to have that critical link where they can push their consumer between each other and pool their consumers in a space where they know they're going to get the best professional care and outcome. But how can you do that when those changes that you're talking about create a more competitive atmosphere and they're actually going to be competing with each other? So while Monica and Monica's going to talk in a second, while well, Monica's talking about moving from competition to collaboration, when you've got a system like NDIS, it could actually be far more competitive or monopolistic. There's one part of Western Australia where there are, there's only one provider for aged care disability services and their margin that they're charging Aboriginal services is like 400% because they Definitely. can do it. Definitely. And so, you know, you've got very exactly. complicated environments. Well, if I can put it back in the sense, I'll, I'll tell you a, a quick snapshot through, uh, say, from a Torres Strait perspective of being an island man. And if I was a consumer with a cast net standing on the jetty and going, I want, I want a good range of uh, people who can provide me a service and throw my net out and I hit nothing, um, I'll definitely move to make sure I find what I'm looking for. But for me as a consumer, I have to understand the demographic, the environment, what's happening in the water and as well as the elements of the day. 
But if that still doesn't help me, then I'll need someone to provide me with a boat so I can actually go out a little bit further. And I think from a consumer's, um, an organisational point of view, if there are shortfalls within our community, maybe we should look at coming together to create entities that can help stabilise the flux in our communities and the environment and say, well, if there are shortfalls, we'll identify that and let's look at collaborative ways of which we, we can um, help our consumers out because consumers will move. Definitely, if there's a need, and I know of people who have moved to provide um, a living standard for their loved ones at a cost to themselves, um, but I, I, I see a lot in the siloed systems that people say, this is my money, and you go, it's not your money, it's federal money. You know, you didn't put that in your bank yourself. It's consumer's money. Um, but how do we change that? And it just comes down to real people who can think outside the box and say, we know the great mindsets we have in the room or in our sector. Can we sit down and shape some, of, some future collaboration and, and outcomes for our consumer? And who's going, to f who's going to create the incentive for them to do that? Are those consume, uh, those um, mindsets that come at the table. So if, if someone has more money than someone else, and you go, well, they're going to come through me first to go to you, they're still touching my service, how do I look at partnering and probably cross-pollinating some of those funds to assist you to get that equilibrium or to make sure that we're not letting so one of our services collapse. So for them, you're increasing the pot? In yes. Sense. Right. Yeah. Good. I'll, I'll take that as a comment rather than a question unless somebody else wants to comment on it. I'd probably like to comment on it. I think that um, the gentleman's highlighting something really interesting. For the last couple of decades, we've almost created passive health consumers because the money's been available. We've largely been a younger, healthier population. We're now reaching that tipping point where more of us are older, becoming more, more multi-morbid, etc. Um, speak so for yourself. <coughs> I know, speak for <laughs> myself. Um, so as a consequence, we need... I think our whole psychology, as people retire particularly, we're going to have time on our hands, we're going to have health issues, we're going to have family members and neighbours that we care about that perhaps are suffering. So the notion of not just patient-centred care, but real patient co-design, co-delivery, etc. because people, I think, are going to start putting their hands up and volunteering and say, hey, I see a space over there and they'll access different technologies and different resources and add that to the mix and get stuff moving. And but we you, as but you're, you're hypothesising people who've got time in their lives. Mm. I mean, these are the people who need this most are the people who've got no time in their lives. They've got three kids to look after on a pension that underfunds their life. And it, it, I haven't got the capacity to do that. And then on the other side, you're being patronising if you say, I'll do it for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, and they're your clients. They're your everyday clients. You know them better than I mean, there's people from community controlled organisations who know them very well, but you know them too. I do, and certainly even amongst our patients. So, you know, amongst some of the most disadvantaged people in a metropolitan setting that you'll ever find, I'm still surprised at the, the amount of volunteering resilience you know, people who might be on welfare, but in two hours a week, the stuff that they can put together and do for others, or the amount of navigation they can do that will help others, or the amount of lobbying they can do, or the amount of identifying where funds are and trying to join it up, is actually quite surprising. And Australia is, again, I think, maturing in our philanthropic volunteering sense. The Americans and other parts of the world have been much more philanthropic and, and community-based than we have means for a long time. random, yeah. rather than systemic mm. and playing the system. I'd probably challenge that, Norman. I think. I think you know. I think for me, a model of solution, a model of care looks like a, a balance between government, community, philanthropic, and corporate funding to deliver an outcome. You know, we we talk about the measure that we want to get. I mean, but the it's not random philanthropy. It's planned philanthropy into an integrated plan. That's 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 exactly right. I mean, so there is you know there are individual examples, and, and you know I, I think everyone in the room here is obviously passionate about something. So. With passion comes, you know, volunteering or contribution. So even though this, you know, group is, uh, you know, may or may not be philanthropically inclined from a planned perspective, I'll, I would expect that most of the rooms are a generous room, um, and those who do actually have the the wherewithal to be philanthropically inclined and planned about it I'm are doing so as well. Yeah. You know, so I think there's volunteering and there's also philanthropy. Can I just can make can a I, quick comment? Can I just, can I just, sorry, add, you know, and in terms of measurement, I, I think, you know, individual wellness. I mean, I'm the best measure of my own health. So let's just actually ask people, you know, I may, I may be, you know, have a chronic health issue. I may have a whole heap of other things going on. But in actual fact, if you ask me and I'm okay, well then, great. 
Yep. You know, let's not let's not benchmark against other people. Let's yep. benchmark against ourselves. Yep. Sorry, let's, let's not make assumptions. Go on. My really quick comment is that uh, the My Community Directory platform now has 120,000 people. We know they look at about quarter of a million pages a month. So we can actually look at consumer demand-driven service delivery. We know what people are searching for. We know where they're looking because that's where innovation lives. Shared data means that we can get smart people thinking about the solutions. So for me, it is consumer-driven because it is what they're searching for, not, not what they put in a census form, but what did people look at in Barcaldon this week? What's happening in Mount Isa? Let's try to use the data to ask the questions to be consumer-centred. And that's only possible if we start thinking about shared data platforms. So, oh, just Monica. Is this working? Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, another sector where we've had the same complexity and government tried to lead it and, you know, we spent equally amounts of money probably that we have in health. Um, and, you know, I'm a bit of a pragmatist that has optimism. Um, I, I don't think we're ever going to get a government-led solution on this and very rarely does government ever lead in these items because the nature of public good is that they're always going to be risk-averse, right? And they're going to be um, equally, we add to that, the, the big P political layer and no one wants to take that political capital risk. Um, if they could see a guaranteed upside on it, they would all fall all over it, but, but they really can't. So I think um, my aspiration for 2020 is that we have a national wellbeing index that's published every day if we could and we see the trend line on that and that I have a reflection of what my wellbeing index, and that's generated from my data that sits around every day because I'm going to be totally data driven and it comes to me. So each day I can see my progress and we can see them. I think um, if I look to transportation, so transportation in most states wants personal journey mapping so that we can use the assets that are exist in the community to mobilise ourselves to productivity or participation. And most um, government agencies are trying and spending a lot of money on trying to create these apps that I want to download that's, in, you know, the government of New South Wales or Victoria. New South Wales did a really cool thing. They actually just said, look, we're the holders of the data, but we're never going to develop platforms to suit every different person that wants to do it. So you know what they did? They took their data and they, they published it sorry for the technology, they published it in API format, right? Which just means that anyone that develops an app, anyone that has an item can pull that data in and then they can personalise it to what I want, to you want. I'm a competing, I might use my trip, you might use your trip, you might use, you know, I'm on the bus trip, um, whatever it is, but they're using the real-time data and the API was the empowerment. So now what they've got is instead of a government going through a, a $10 million exercise that takes four years, they've actually now got, in the space of eight weeks since they turned that API on, they've got 15 different platforms providing real-time data to people the way that they want it. And I, I think there's some lessons in that for health. Um, yes, I realise that there's a whole privacy thing, whether a bus is on time and where it is, is very different to whether I have diabetes or how I've gone. But, you know, the same principles could apply, we just need to wrap a wrapper around it. And then what happens is lots of people that, that represent groups, I, I spend a lot of time in philanthropy, not-for-profit and social enterprise. There is a will out there to start to design massive systems that are, with real money, you know, half a billion dollars worth of systems that will pick up um, the disenfranchised because we are over waiting for a government to do it and watching them waste more and more of our tax paper. Is this a social enterprise model? There is social and there's systemic social enterprise models. So Social Ventures Australia, meaning Philanthropy Australia, meaning the, you know, people like Tim Fairfax's trust that's put a lot of money into Indigenous health and education and seen most of it not produce any outcomes. So we're seeing things like my big project, Ralph Ashton out of Sydney, who's now saying, okay, how do we drive? I've got, you know, I've, he's raised about $10 million across eight corporates. He's added philanthropy money to that. And they said one of their pillars is actually around this uplift of personalised health delivery um, in a joined up way, but in communities managed by community people that can come in, but using data to actually sequence the events, to give feedback on the events and to pull in the personalised data you need to actually do that in an unwasteful and highly productive way and delivered in a way that's culturally or tribally accepted to my tribe at Upper America about equally as my tribe in the Taurus or my tribe in Aracoon. And scalable? Um, and scalable. Um, and we have the potential to do that in Australia and then materialise that into a global practice. Um, I think that's where we should get on the bus. At the moment, this bus is, you know, you're gorgeous. You all want to do the same thing. But everyone's kind of trying to do it from their own area and it costs us time and money. Um, so let's find a, a, a bus that we can all get on. So APIs is yeah. good. 
Thanks. Um, that's a beautiful segue back to um, uh, one of our organisation's bold steps for the future, which um, I should chat about investment with that so we can get it happening by 2020. Um, we talk about, you know, that data that's out there that people want, but and there's, there's some limited safety and quality data out there, but not in formats that consumers can really find and not in ways that make, can help us make decisions about who and where we receive care from. What we want to create are some really simple consumer design um, measurement tools for the delivery of services. So, you know, what safety and quality data do we want? I don't think that that's being reported at the moment, but, you know, having a process where a whole different range of consumers can be asked that question. You've got the honour of having the last question. Well, what an, what an honour. Um, Dom Sandylands, North West Remote Health. Um, uh, I've got a question which is related to the consumer more from a, a, a governance point of view and, and um, at what point in you know, 2020, NDIS is embedded, uh, we'd, we'd expect, NDIS. Uh, we've got stronger competitive forces going on, we'd expect. Uh, at what point do organisations start joining up the value chain and at what point is it maybe collusion and at, and maybe the ACCC would actually be considering it? So we're talking about so collaboration. I'm going to ask Monica, Monica to come back to the microphone because I think you must have thought about that. Because a very good question. Do, do you just, just want to run that again? Because yeah. Monica was probably thinking about something else while you yeah. asked your question. Yeah, OK. Well, so in, in a competitive environment, at what point is collaboration actually collusion in the eyes of, say, ACCC? Yeah, we haven't probably tested enough of that. We tend to uh, loosely put, as, as long as it's got a social good at the centre of it, um, then usually we're solving problems that other people don't, don't have commercial interest in until we join the volume up into a place that then commercial people want to play in. So I think we're in the experimenting phase, you're fine. The minute it becomes a commercial venture, then we need to protect ourselves by having a, some sort of an entity under which we do it. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be, and we're designing those quite often now where we just split equity holdings amongst whoever many players are there. Some people can put cash in, some can't, but we just divide equity amongst stakeholders. We're also reinventing and bringing back to life the mutual model. And I think what we'll find as we move into the new economy, there will be less of this idea that I'm a proprietary limited or I'm a listed company. And we're going to see really um, people-centered organizations. So the idea of mutual, meaning that we all, you know, in the old fashion, we demutualized everything um, and we corporatized. I think we're seeing a move back to mutualization because individuals want to have a vested say in how this disrupted supply chain can affect them and what we'll invest in. So I think we'll see mutuals. I think the ACCC will have a crack. Depends where it is. Um, Indigenous health, you know, who, who's competing for that? And in some parts of Australia, you've got monopolies charging outrageous margins in, in the Aboriginal community, so you haven't got any competition. It's usually government money. It's not usually a, a mm. consumer-driven money. If we move the whole, let's say we move the whole healthcare model to consumer-driven, right? So now we say, in, like the NDAs, but my whole primary health care is actually about I've got a bunch of money and I can, in a gamified way, draw down on it. Um, you know, then what you've done is you said to consumers, you choose. Um, and so you can set up a bunch of different conglomerates and ways that people can choose. We might end up with Coles and Woolies, um, mm. but of healthcare. Um, I suspect we probably would. But it's interesting play. It's a, um, we haven't tested it yet. Good question. Thank you very much indeed. Could you please thank our panel?